right, you guys, it's episode 46 of War Stories. And before I get into this, let me just say something real quick. So as you guys can see, I'm trying to get more content out. I'm trying to spread it out between Inner Demons, War Stories, Curb Talk, and some of the other series that we're trying to roll out. I mean, I'm, I got my hands full. I got the two prison series, the state and federal prison that I'm going to try to roll out. I also have Game Time, and then I have another new series that I think you guys are going to like. This is just going to keep me busy around the clock. But that series is called Hip Hop Hot Seat. You guys will see what it's about probably this week. I'm going to try to get the first episode out this week. But anyways, I want to hit you guys with a quick war story. This is going to be a quick drive-by. Nothing crazy, nothing spectacular. I got some bangers for you guys that I'm going to kick later on this week after I kind of get a couple more videos out across the board anyway so i'm gonna take you guys all the way back to 1988 the first time well let me take that back it wasn't the first time i hit the county jail but i was 18 years old and it had to have been like the second or third time because i only i hit the county jail at 18 and i want to say it was like the second time it was the second time so if you guys think back the first time i hit the county jail i got arrested with my mom <laughs> Imagine that. I got arrested with my mom at the age of 18 for a possession for sale. Some of you might remember that story. You know, unfortunately, she ended up bringing a narc to me. It wasn't obviously wasn't intentional, but she did out of desperation. And we ended up both catching the case. I took the case because it was my first time in jail. They kicked me out. I got OR. But I want to say it was the second time after I went back. This incident happened right here. So 1988, again, I've talked about the county jail several times to you guys. It was a different place. The county jail was like a lightweight gladiator school. That's that's how I refer to it, because as I told you guys, San Francisco County Jail used to allow you to hold up to thirty dollars in your pocket on the sixth floor when you would come in. When you would catch a case, you come into the bullpen in the front and then they process you out. Man, you used to have to sit up there for probably like a half a day with a thousand other cats waiting to get processed, smell like ass and feet. You know what I mean? Uh, eventually, you'd be so tired that you grab a toilet paper roll and lay on the floor and use it as a pillow or lay somewhere and just try to just get some sleep until they called you to the back. So... They process you back. You know, you, you had to go see classification, get fingerprinted, get your, your picture took, and then they just take you to the back. Once you got to the back, you were allowed to keep your personal clothes on. They didn't dress you out in orange. That would come after you went to like your arraignment or your, your preliminary hearing. And they basically found out that the county jail, that the county was going to keep you that you weren't going to get bailed out or they weren't going to OR you or release you. So once they found out that you were going to stay, then they dress you out in orange. But for like sometimes up to two weeks, you could be on the sixth floor in your personal clothes and you'd have money in your pocket. And again, you know, back in those days, the county jail was different. You know, I, I went through the San Francisco County Jail back in like 1996. And it was only like 10 years after the first time I had been there, but it still was a lot different. When I went there in 88, it was it was ran like a lightweight, you know, there was convicts. The trustees, they were all game tight. They were, you know, cats that were hustling. They were trying to, you know, move dope. They knew who had dope. When you come in, they get at you. They hit you up. Hey, you bring anything or you want anything? You know, there's there's black, there's we got coke, we got crystal, we got some weed, some tobacco, whatever you want. So they always had dope there. That was one thing about the San Francisco County Jail that was cool. And I don't know if it was because, you know, they had a lot of open pipelines back then or they had COs that were bringing it in, but it just seemed like the whole mentality of, you know, the inmates that were in the county jail, it was ran different. Anyway, so for the first two weeks, I was in my regular clothes and they put me in, I want to say it was D-Tank. And D-Tank is, it's on the sixth floor, 
this for guys that are just coming into the to the jail, but most of these guys had been to the joint. I don't know why they put me in D tank because I had never been to the joint at that time. So you got like A tank, I think is the medical, and then you got B, C, D, E, and F. Then I want to say like G is a hole, H is a hole or something like that. But those main tanks, they're they're like 30 man tanks. So when you go in the tank, there's two tables in the middle, and then there's four cells on each side. Each cell holds about anywhere from eight to twelve people. So you got four different, four different cells. You go in there, you know, a lot of times you're not just gonna go anywhere. Most of the time, just by that's just the way that people, you know, that that we used to do it, we would automatically go with our own people. Africanos will go with Africanos. I would obviously look for if there was any tanks in there with Rasa. If not, you know, then I just, I go wherever. But anyway, so, you know, the the, the first time that, or the second, whatever it was, that I went in there, you know, it was just a learning experience for me. I started to learn about just jail. Just, you know, I had done some, some time as a as an adolescent, but I had never done adult time. So it was kind of like the training grounds for me. And to be honest with you guys, you know, there wasn't no NR members in that tank that uh, that they put me in the first time I went to that particular tank on the sixth floor. There was a lot of Africanos, a lot of old school Africanos, BGF um, cats that had been to the joint that had done a lot of time. Now, there was one individual that stood out. His name was Mario Sims. Big dude, big yoked up cat. And I want to say he was from Army Street. Uh, I can't be sure. He was either from Army Street or he's from Fillmore. He was out the Fillmore. But this cat, you know, like within a few days after I got in there, I could tell he was, he was, he was like a leader for the Africanos. Older dude, been around, carried himself well, and just the way he moved around in there, and you know, he just had influence. I could tell. But he wasn't, he wasn't a bully type of dude. He was a cool cat. He was laced up. You know, one of them old school BGF type of cats that mellow, but could turn it up when it needed to be turned up. And he turned it up a lot. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of get into that with you guys. So, you know, after the first week I was there, um, you know, I started to, to have a little bit of influence over the Rasa that was there. There was some paisas and you know the woods used to go in our tanks if i would you know when we go in there to a new tank usually africanos would all be together they'd all try to stay in you know their own tanks and then there'd usually be like one tank where the rasa would go the woods the, the others usos whatever so we weren't running with the woods, but it was kind of like they were in our tank, so they kind of fell up under us if that makes sense not to the point of if Somebody came in there and pushed up on them that we'd have their back or anything like that. It was just that, like, being in the tank, they kind of fell up under, you know, the influence of, of that tank, the rest of us. But as far as any anything, you know, kicking off, they were on our own. Those lines were drawn. So, you know, being there, 18-year-old, I was a little cocky youngster, thought I was tough. You know, I was I, I I had a nice little violent uh, streak in me. You know, I had a strong craving of violence back in those days because I learned I learned as a as a young gang member early on. I, I told you guys this several times. I've learned that, you know, as a young gang member out there in the streets, the more violent that you are, the more blood you spill the more respect you get. The more people fear you, the more people respect you. That's just the way that the streets work. And I learned that. I learned that from watching a lot of my older homies. Homeboys that had a, you know, a history of, of putting hands on cats or had a history of stabbing people in, in the hood or shooting people in the neighborhood or even in the joint. I used to hear about some of the things they would do in the joint. You know, yeah, the homie, you know, the homie just uh, got rolled up. He was over there in Solano. I heard he just hit, you know, several individuals over there and he caught, caught a shoe program. So we used to hear about stuff like that in the, in the pen. 
And I would see some of these older homies from my neighborhood. And, you know, because I was hearing things like that about them, it made me respect them. So, you know, I started, I started to chase that, that same respect. You know, I, I would do, I would, I would commit acts of violence just to show out, just to, to show that I was capable of, of doing it. A lot of times there was no reason for it. I was victimizing people just to show out. But I mean, that's, that's the mindset of, of young gang members. That's, that's what we used to do anyway. So I always got along real good with Africanos. I always just, I always bonded with them. I always had good rapports with them. I went to school with them. You know, I was locked up with them when we were kids. I just always bonded with them. Africanos, you know, some of some Africanos were some of my best friends when I was younger. And at, at one point, you know, I was even going to Visitation Valley in San Francisco, which is an all black school in Viz, in Visitation Valley over by Sunnydale. Then I went to Woodrow Wilson, which is another all Africano school. So, you know, I grew up around a lot of them and I knew them. So as we got older, I would end up running into them in the county jails and in prisons. So, like I said, just being in the tank, in the tank I was in, I started to exhibit a little bit of influence, you know, call it what you want. I was pushing my weight around a little bit, you know, making sure that everybody in there was cleaning, had a day to clean. I was making sure that they just weren't in there, you know, being slobs and, you know, that cats were taking showers. And some of you that don't know about jail and prison, you might be like, come on, man, how you going to tell me to take a shower? Man, it's a respect thing. When you're locked up and you're in close proximity to cats and you guys are locked up in a tank like that and you got somebody that's laying there for three or four days and they're not washing their ass, you know, it's either getting the water or get hands put on you. You know, nobody wants to smell your ass, man. You know, it's all about it's all about self-respect. You know, if you don't you don't have self-respect at least respect other people around you you know you can't lay around stinking like a slob all day so you know little things like that but i was learning things like that from watching these africanos how they ran their tanks i was young i was 18 i had to, to learn how to conform with with jail life i had to learn how to function in jail and a lot of it was just watching watching paying attention to what other people were doing and then applying it myself so there came a point when Mario, the Africano that I that I told you guys, I think is from Army Street, the one that had the influence in there. There came, there was a couple incidents where it was either over commissary, over somebody's mouth, or whatever it was. This dude would stab him. He he kept a pedazo in his by his bunk at all, at all times. I used to trip out on the dude. So he had a toilet bowl scrubber and it was a big ass bed also. It was a, it was a nice, nasty, but it was all plastic. It wasn't gonna, wasn't gonna kill you. It just put some holes in you. But anytime he had conflict or anytime anybody would talk back to him, next, he'd creep over to his bed. And this is a big dude. He had like a, a fucked up leg, but he's a big dude yoked up in his, I wanna say his forties. And they wouldn't be expecting it. They'd be kicking back, playing cards or something. And all of a sudden, this dude just starts stabbing him. He'd have him on the ground, just poking him in the face. Bop, bop, bop. You know what I'm saying? Ninja. You know what I'm saying? I'll kill your mother. You know what I'm saying? So I used to trip out on the dude. I used to trip on him. And, you know, I used to just watch him every time he used to do that. And after he stabbed somebody, he had a bag that he used to keep the pedazo in with the little piece of cloth and he'd use that cloth to wipe the blood off and then he wind it back up and stick it up under his bunk and he kept it there and he he stabbed I want to say he stabbed within a three to four month span I want to say he stabbed about six dudes that's 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 how crazy this fool was I mean he just if somebody talked back to him you know, that's that's what he would do. And, you know, I, I paid attention to that. I watched it and, you know, I ended up making me a pedazo. So I made a pedazo one day 
and you know, I put a little tip on it. And nobody educated me. Nobody sat me down and showed me how to make a pedazo. Later on, like I told you guys I would stab somebody in Bruno. In Santa, uh, San Francisco has another county jail that's located in San Bruno. It's still part of San Francisco's jail. They just lease that property to house inmates from San Francisco County. Anyway, it's like a baby Quentin. But I told you guys how I stabbed a couple individuals over there. Nobody taught me how to make a, a pedazo at that time. Nobody sat down and educated me. But when you think about it, you don't really... Who, who needs to be educated on how to make a paraso? You don't really, really anything that you can sharpen to a point that will break flesh that's indurated enough to break flesh is considered a stabbing instrument. You could use a pencil, a toothbrush, a little piece of plastic, whatever, as long as it breaks skin. So that was, you know, that's that was my outlook. You know, I didn't ask anybody to sit down and, and show me. I got a toilet bowl scrubber, popped off the top, found a little rough spot on the concrete and sharpened it. And I let him know, you know, out of respect, hey, hey, Mario, I let him know because, you know, I had somewhat of, of an association with this dude, too. I didn't tell you guys about that, but he knew my mom and he knew my stepfather from just being out there in the in the dope scene they were selling dope and when i told him who my stepfather was and my mom he was like what that cat that's your mom he was like oh man you know so we had that that rapport we had a rapport with each other so anyway when i made that pedazo i told him hey mario i got me one and i'm just letting you know out of respect it's not for none of you or your people man it's you know it's for if some, somebody comes up in here that don't belong in here or if i get into it you know, an issue, that's what that's what I'm going to use it for. He's like, hey, you're good, man. You know what I mean? Do your thing. So the first time I stabbed somebody, the first time and I wanted to stab somebody, as much as this dude was stabbing people in there, I wanted to show people that, you know, I was capable of doing it. I wanted to be the Mario, <laughs> straight up. I wanted to be the Mexican Mario in that tank. I'm telling you guys, I was a young, dumb, cocky um, youngster, man, that I was a loose cannon, you know, but I wanted to I, I wanted to emulate the things that he was doing. I wanted that same respect. I wanted people to fear me like people feared him. So, you know, it came down to uh, one issue I had was so I had like three, four dollars in my pocket and I was playing Pinocchio one day with. White Cat and an Africano, and I think it was two Africanos. They were partners, and, and White Dude was my partner. We were playing Pinochle. And I got up from the table that's out there in the main section in the pod, and I went into my tank, and I reached in my pocket for something, and I dropped a dollar. It fell out of my pocket. I must have reached in my pocket, pulled my hand out, and it just fell. So... There was a paisa, he was like a paisa that didn't speak no English. Um, he just used to just kind of was always just in the way in there, man. He was always in the way, just doing weird shit, you know, looking in the garbage, um, asking people if they wanted, you know, their their leftover food, and you couldn't communicate with them, so it made it, it made him more of a you know an annoyance. Anyway, so at some point later, I reached into my pocket and I noticed that that dollar was gone. I noticed that it was gone. And, you know, right away, I was like, I had to have dropped it in the tank. And, you know, when I went in the tank, there was another dude in there and he was like, B, he was like, hey, man, I'm not trying to get involved. He's like, but that bicep picked that dollar up that you dropped. I seen him. It was on the floor. As soon as you dropped it, he stepped on it and he put it in his pocket. So I'm like, oh, okay. So I was like, I got me one, you know, and honestly, to be 100% honest with you guys, my first inclination was not to stab him. I was going to sock him up. That was the first, because I hadn't done it yet. 
this was going to be the first time in a county jail setting that I was going to stab somebody. So, you know, when I went in the tank, I looked around again and he was like, I'm telling you, man, I seen it. He came in there and I'm like, why didn't you say something, man? Why didn't you tell me when it happened? And he was like, man, look, I'm not trying to get involved in nothing. I'm just trying to fucking keep my, my head low, man, and, and stay to myself. And I'm like, well, why are you telling me now then? You know what I'm saying? He's like, because, man, you know, I see you looking around and, you know, if that dude's going to be stealing, he shouldn't be coming in this tank, right? And that's where he lived. So I was like, all right, man, I'm not tripping. And, you know, the white dude that I was playing Pinocchio with him and there was a couple other dudes and they were like, you know, a couple of them were in the tank just laying back watching TV and, and some of them were just kicking back. And when I went in the tank, because the bison was in there, they all started getting up and walking out. They were like, B, handle your business, man. You know, fuck them up, right? <laughs> so, you know, I, I went over to the bison. And I'm like, hey, man. I said, hey, you got my dollar? And he was like, he was like, no, no, I, I, I don't. I don't got your dollar. He said, no, no. And I said, man, you got my dollar, man. Give me my dollar. And he was like, man, he was like, no, no, no say, no say. He was saying something in Spanish and he was playing stupid. And I, I kept telling him, man, look, give me my motherfucking dollar or I'm going to do something to you, man. I'm, I'm telling you right now, the best thing you can do for yourself is give me that dollar and you're going to be up out of here. Otherwise, if you don't, I'm going to do something to you and you're going to get up out of here anyway. He probably didn't understand what I was telling him, but he didn't want to give it up. Instead, you know, he does something. He does something that was just a straight boneheaded move, right? So at one point, I'm in there still looking and he's standing there. He must have reached in his pocket and grabbed it and then tried to throw it on the floor under the bed, right? I seen it. I seen it out, the, out of my peripheral. I seen it. As soon as it hit the floor, I seen it. I looked over at it. And I walked over and I said, what's this, man? I said, you want to play? You want to play with my money? And he was like, no. He was like, I, you know, I, it was like, I, I, uh, I, didn't, I don't I don't touch your money. I don't steal. You know, he could speak a little bit of English, but it was broken. So right away, you know, like I said, I thought about whooping on this cat. And I walked back out in the tank. And for a minute, I was just, I was thinking, how should I handle this, man? Should I, should I just fuck him up or should I stick him? And, you know, I still don't really understand the, the dynamics of politics yet, how they work. But, you know, in retrospect, I'm over here thinking about what I should do, but everybody in the tank was probably like, what is he going to do? You know, he has to do something because you don't let somebody just do something like that to you. And why is he waiting? Right. But I was just trying to think about what I was going to do. Should I bomb on him? Should I just, you know, just beat him up or should I stab him? So, you know, thinking about it, I was like, I'm going to stab him. You know, he he played me like some kind of fucking dummy. And, you know, the piece I had, it wasn't going to kill him. It was just going to put some holes in him. And, you know, so I went in there. I got the pedazo and I went and told, because the bicep came out of the tent. He came out and he sat on the table. Now he's trying to watch TV. Like he's out in the in the general area so that he's not seen. <laughs> so he's not trapped in, in the tank. He wants to be out in the general area. So if the COs walk by, they can see him. Or if something happens, it's going to happen out there. He's going to have to go back in there sooner or later. But I tell the white dude, I'm like, hey. Go get that dude and see if you can get him to go back there in the tank. Just, just see if you can call him back there so, so I can handle my business, man. So white dude, he goes over and he's like, hey, come here, man. He's like, come here, let me talk to you. And the dude hesitates. He hesitates. He knows something's up, man. And he's like, what's up, man? He's like, come here, man. Let me talk to you. He's like, don't win. Oh, it's all good, man. You know, it's all good. So the dude gets up. He gets up and I'm standing. I got one foot on the on the on the um the bench because I'm we're sitting at the table playing pinochle, and I'm just waiting. I'm watching the dude out of my peripheral, but I'm not looking directly at him. I'm fucking with my hand. So the white boy goes in 
goes in the tank and he calls him in there, but the dude just stays in the doorway where the gate set. He just stays right there. He doesn't walk all the way in. So I'm like, fuck this dude. And aside from, I want to say, aside from your clothes, you also had your shoes. They also let, yeah. At that time, they also let you wear your shoes. So I put my hand down, my pinochle hand, and I walk up behind the dude and I kick him in the back. I kick him in the lower back. And he goes flying in the, the tank. When he goes flying in, the white dude, he fucking comes up out of there like a bat out of hell. So when he goes in, I pull the parasol out and dudes just start, dudes start freaking out. He's like, no, you know, I, I, I didn't I didn't steal nothing from you. I didn't steal nothing. I just go in on him. You guys ready? I'm sticking him, but I'm going to give you guys that. <laughs> hey, man, I lit his ass up. So I stuck him. I stuck him in his back. I stuck him, you know, a couple times in his head. I stuck him in his face. I was poking him with the pedazo. And... It didn't have the best point on it. You know, when I'm sticking them, it wasn't like it was going deep in, but it was it was drawing blood. At one point, you know, he tries he tries to to go out of the tank. He tries to run out and the white dude that's out there closes the tank. He closes the door, the gate to our tank. So now he's locked in there with me. So he climbs up on the gate. He climbs up on the gate and he starts shaking the gate. I just start hitting him in the back. <laughs> anyway, after hitting the dude, you know, a gang of times, man, all bullshit aside, I'm giving you a conservative number. I hit him at least 15 to 20 times. But again, you know, this pedazo was a lot of them were scratches. They were just scratching them. Some of them were breaking the skin. He was leaking. The only place he was really leaking was where I hit him in the head. The you know when I hit him in the back and the arms, they were just deep welts, deep scratches. So I hit I hit him a couple times while he's up on the gate. I'm hit. <clears throat> I'm sticking him in the, in his in his ribs, and he starts he starts screaming. He starts screaming and. The deputies are always right there. The office is like one tank down and they can hear when somebody's yelling or when there's people thumping. You can just hear it. So somebody said, hey, they're coming. They're coming in. So I take the pedazo. I can't do nothing with it. I take it and I throw it up under the bunk on the floor all the way in the corner. If I, I don't want to put it on somebody's bunk. I don't want to put it on my bunk. And then I lay on the bed. I lay on the bed and I had took my T-shirt off right before I got ready to start stabbing this dude. And I laid on my bunk. I had a bottom bunk and I threw the T-shirt over my face and I just laid there. I was fucking winded. I'm laying there trying to control my breathing so that when the COs come in, you know, it looks like I'm asleep. But I'm trying to control my breath. And, you know, all they had to do was look at me and you could see, man, my stuff, you know, yeah, this dude was definitely involved. And there was only three of us in the tank. And another one was the other cat that was in there was an older white dude. And he was up on his top bunk, sick. And, you know, they they looked at him. They probably looked at him and was like, you know, we know who's involved. But they didn't. They didn't write me up. They didn't pull me out. They were more mad that this dude was yelling like a bitch straight up. And, you know, they pulled him out. They pulled him out. They were like, hey, man, get your shit. Get your shit. Where's your, where's your bunk at? They told him, grab his mattress, grab your shit. We're going to move you across the hall. That's all they did. They ended up moving him. Um, You know, there was, there was another incident that I'll get into in another episode However, again, I just sat back and I watched Mario. You know, there was many other instances where he was stabbing people in there. And I used to just trip out on the dude, man. All it took was for somebody to just say something, talk back to him or to rub him the wrong way. You know, he was a he was a dolphin. He was one of them big ass yoked up dolphins that 
probably spent all his life coming in and out of prison, was around during the times when the weight piles were out there. So he had his he had his swells on. Um then he was, you know, he was obviously laced up under that old school mentality. But you know, as far as I've never seen an Africano like him when it came to somebody, you know, when it came to stabbing people in the in a county jail or a prison setting. I ran into a lot of BGF members and, you know, them cats are with the business and they'll stab somebody. But this dude, I had never ran into any other Africano ever throughout my entire time doing time in prison or in the county jails that were that fast to pick up a piece and just start stabbing. I mean, dude was like an old school NF member. And I, I mean, I had a lot of respect for him. He was doing his thing and he had a lot of respect in there, man. Um, but, you know, in some type of way, I look to him as, you know, some type of, as, as an example, you know, I, I watched him, I watched how he interact, how he interacted with other Africanos in there and, you know, I tried to be like him in some kind of way. So I'm not going to lie. I'm going to just keep it real with you guys. I'm 18. I'm a youngster. I'm a kid, man. You know, but I'm learning. But again, I wanted to be the Mario for the Mexicans and uh, in the, that tank. And to be honest with you, you know, it kind of stuck with me. The, the mentality that I picked up from him, it kind of stuck with me. That would stick with me throughout the years when I would come back to the county jail for other you know, other things or when, you know, I hit Bruno and I stabbed that other dude with that ladle. I mean, I hit him good. I knocked his tooth out. I hit him in the cheek. I hit him a couple times, but when I hit him in the cheek, it went through his cheek and it knocked his tooth out. But I want to say a lot of that was because of what I picked up from Mario straight up. When I would get into conflict, I started to emulate that dude. It was all about go, go and get my pedazo and and get with with this individual whoever it was and you know i know this was a short one you know i still i gave you guys some you know what i'm saying gave you a little bit of that um i'm gonna try to put some more videos out all week that's all i'm gonna be doing i'm gonna be working on the new series we're gonna go hard man all gas no breaks so you guys look for the content to come out. Now, let me say this. Last night, I tried to run a live. I tried to run a live for the purpose of doing the raffle. And this is the thing. So yesterday, early morning, without even thinking about it, I put out about 15 shorts. I released a bunch of shorts. And I re you know, later on that evening, yesterday, I tried to run that live to do the raffle and YouTube wasn't shooting out no notifications. And then I remember why. So YouTube will only send out so many notifications per channel a day. I don't remember what the exact number is, but obviously I had already ran my limit because, you know, I, I tried to run that live like six different times. I cut it off, restarted it, cut it off, restarted it, cut it off, cut it, cut it, it. I restarted, cut it off, restarted, and it's still no notifications were being sent. So I'm going to try to run that raffle, if not sometime midweek, Wednesday. If not, I'll run it on this weekend. So for those of you that are still trying to get in, last minute tickets, you have at least a couple more days. But I did try to run it last night. There was a couple of you that popped in and I asked you guys, did you get a notification? They were like, nah, man, I was just surfing. I just popped in, seen that you were on. So I was like, man, I'm going to have to run this later because nobody's getting notifications. So that's what I did. Anyway, I just want to give you guys a heads up about that. You know, I'll keep that in mind in the future. I was hoping to get that raffle done last night, but, you know, it is what it is, man. We'll get it done this week, though. You know, that'll give me some more time anyway to try to get some more items together to raffle off to you guys anyways you guys like i said you know we're gonna get some more content out to you guys this week i'm working on more profiles as well as all these different series that i'm trying to put out at the same time i got my hands full am i doing too much nah we went dark for a couple weeks so we're playing catch up anyways 
This episode 46 of War Stories. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I know it was short, but hey, it's putting something out. At least you guys have a video for later on tonight, early in the morning. That said, I'm out.